Welcome everyone. It's a great pleasure and honor to be joined by John Verveke and Daniel Saraba. We're continuing here our dialogue, which we started by around the end of the year uh, on John's channel. And I'm going to link to John's channel in the first dialogue and also to Daniel's channel in the description. And I'd um, like to ask both of you first of me to introduce yourselves briefly and then summarize what stood out for you or what you would like to which threats you'd like to continue from last time then i'll respond to this and then we'll see where we're going so maybe john you go first thank you it's a great pleasure to be here i thoroughly enjoyed um the last one a lot um and you and i wanted to thank you both you both were incredibly indulgent to me last time uh, i was talking a lot uh because i was in the midst of um, a bunch of ideas beginning to coalesce and consolidate together. So I just wanted to say I really appreciated that. And I hope I can be a little bit more receptive uh, this time, um, uh, emulate you. So I'm John Verveke. I'm a, an associate professor at the University of Toronto in cognitive psychology and cognitive uh, science. I also have several degrees in philosophy. Um, and my project um, is to try and bridge between the best cognitive science, philosophically informed cognitive science, and, the, and, and, and best spiritual practices for transformation so that people can find ecologies of practices and communities and communities of communities by which they can awaken from what I've called the meaning crisis in a series entitled Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. And I have a bunch of other video series out there as well in which uh, in many of these I'm trying to exemplify and experiment on and also develop uh, a dialogical form of practice by which that integration between science and spirituality uh, could be afforded and perhaps um, enhanced. What I took from last time is I uh, brought a proposal to Johannes and Daniel, and as I said, they were very, very welcoming um, and um, about trying to link, uh, integrate phenomenology, especially the phenomenology that's been taken up into what's called 4E cognitive science and the platonic theory of the forms, which often seem to be very distant from each other, even oppositional to each other. And I propose this in terms of a, uh, a, a practice um, deeply influenced by Marlo Ponti um, um, in his going beyond Husserl's notion of eidetic reduction. I call it eidetic eduction, and it's the idea that we never actually fully perceive any object. We perceive aspects and the number of aspects are unlimited. And when, when you extend that imaginally and conceptually, we get an overwhelming sense of the aspect. But nevertheless, they don't appear, uh, and, and appearance is important here, they don't appear as a cacophony, they appear as a melody. They make sense, they flow together, even though you can't derive one from the other. And there's a through line through it, um, a through line that is, is continuous because the number of aspects is inexhaustible. And I'm suggesting to you that this through line that holds the aspects together in this melodic fashion is uh, not itself another aspect, but something other, it's trans-aspectual. And I'm proposing that this is um, one meaning, uh, one way of understanding what Plato meant by the forums, especially when we remember that the original meaning of idos is the look of something, it's aspect but somehow the look that conveys its deeper identity. And, um, and, and then we, uh, we broached into two, one, well, one related thing, and then something I'd like to add on that was just for me at the edge of my thinking when we were there, um, we talked about uh, the connections between eidetic eduction and this falling in love with being and this reciprocal indwelling, uh, bringing in a bit of Polanyi. I would point out for people who are interested, Meek's book, Contact with Reality, integrates Polanyi and, um, uh, and um, Marla Ponti quite well together. Um, and then for me, that goes to the something else, which is this here, uh, dialogue, dialectic into dialogos, uh, whereas you can think of, you may have individual multi-aspectuality, as I described with eidetic deduction, you also have multiple, multi, multi perspectival abilities on any act of eidetic induction. Uh, so we were sort of doing this meta eidetic induction on eidetic induction. And what we were doing is saying, in addition to the multiple aspects of the thing, there are multiple perspectives on the aspectuality 
of things, and we were trying to bridge that together, and that overlapped uh, with with loving, uh, especially the model of how you uh, love another person. Because when you're loving another person, you're being drawn into their multi aspectuality, their through line, the melody of the mystery of their being. Uh, but of course, they have a perspective other than yours, and the relationship between those perspectives is itself also something that draws out the form. And so you see this in Platonic dialogue, you'll have, right, the eidetic adduction on something, it might be, I don't know, might be courage. And then you have the multi-perspectival, right, move on uh, the eidetic adduction. And we were emulating that last time, uh, well, not emulating it, sorry, we were exemplifying it. I didn't mean emulation, we were exemplifying it uh, last time. Uh, and we, I sort of noted that it, we were sort of doing eidetic adduction on eidetic adduction, uh, bringing in the multi-perspectival through line that's investigating the multi-aspectual through line, if I can put it that way. Um, and that really opens up the beauty of being. So that's sort of how I saw uh, what, uh, what was happening. Um, and it was definitely addressing um, sort of the question and the quest that I had posed at the beginning. So now to you, Daniel. Yeah. So I'm Daniel. Um, those of you who watch Johannes's channel regularly, I guess you will know me by this time. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in Japanese philosophy, in the Kyoto School, and in Heidegger. And I also got then very interested with Johannes and Judith Chinao's philosophy. Um, I'm... I've done some reading groups on religion and nothingness and also a course on religion and nothingness and with, with Johannes' Halkion Academy, which we might also um, do again uh, in the future. And I'm also, yeah, maybe, um, right, I was bringing in this aspect of, of Japanese aesthetics last time and I, I got some feedback from some friends who really liked that and could really see something platonic in my my example of origami yeah. um yeah. <laughs> and right because it's it's a lot about finesse and a lot about how, how we pro but how we approach beings such that they disclose this moreness this multi-aspectuality which we can not right we cannot always get this sense of the through line such as in dialogue right when we try to overpower someone Mm. We just we can just not get to this to this more of things, um, and what I then also did after last time, right? I, I read this up in DC Schindler's book on love, right? This love in the postmodern predicament, oh. where, where he has this discussion about the forms, right? And he says, right, we actually, right, we don't need, right? A lot of people said, right, we don't actually need the forms, right? We have we have all the aspects and we then maybe have organization but right the form goes even beyond that so why mm -hmm. why do we need it then in the first place and then dc schindler had, has this beautiful argument i think right to know the form of a thing is to know the intimate reality of a thing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and this kind of like aspect of intimacy is i think also that you get kind of like when you read a platonic dialogue mm -hmm. because Kind of like we really go into the heart of things um and the through lines seems to to point it, right? you you just said right the, the melody of the mystery of being so it seems that uh yeah i would like to explore this with you together uh very good thank you i would just very briefly say perhaps that what we touched on was Goethe's or phenomenon, mm -hmm. or the mm -hmm. or plant, the or pflanze, the mm -hmm. primordial human being also, um, that he does go looking for in, in Italy, um, and especially in Sicily and other places. But uh, the question is, for me more, why... Um, and in what sense it seems to almost this, is there a certain necessity we could say for the form 
or the question of forms, etc., to make a, such a comeback or a return again now at this um, moment mm. in history in which we are. And this also then comes to a question I wanted to ask last time. I didn't really quite fit in. It's not really fitting in now, but it might. Uh, these, we might. I don't know. It might lead us there, which is the question of or the the phenomenon or whatever we want to call it for now, of the one. Because I know that you are very interested both in Neoplatonism um, yeah. and the question of the one and the many, which is already found in Heraclitus, is yeah. also what drives. German idealism in its start. It's what the three youngsters, Hölderlin, Schelling, and Hegel, want to understand, want to be able to articulate is how the one and the many belong together. Even Heidegger starts speaking of the all unifying one um, in some of his later talks in the 50s and 60s, which he doesn't yeah. do before. Mm -hmm. um, and so there seems to be something that's maybe th this is a bit. Uh, um, just um very broad uh, brushes but i want to explore this more and also when it when it comes to melody then perhaps we're also just by association or so in the realm of the question of harmony mm -hmm. and when we talk about uh harmony then i always bring in the uh fragment uh, eight from from heraclitus where um he says that What's most dissonant and most bursting apart is coming together as the most beautiful harmony. Mm -hmm. So there's this natural, if you like, tension or so in that which is um, harmonious also. So it's, it doesn't completely, it's, it's not leveling or, or so or homogenizing. Um, but uh, say uh, accommodating difference and um mm -hmm. even maybe the disharmonious or um that which is does, that does not fully fit in or so so the, these are a few thoughts but mostly what was stuck out for me was the, the, this strange phenomenon maybe that now we are returning to forms in a certain way that this seems to be uh crucial at the very edge of what post-modernity can say or think or articulate or needs to articulate even. I would like to take up the historical question first, but I would like to return to the question of the one. Yeah. Um, I think uh, I think that would be a good order. Is that, is that okay with you, Daniel? Um, um, so, yeah, why the return? I mean, I, I want to first say that I think um, that's correct. We're seeing this return. I I've been reading uh, Zawicki's book, The Experience of Meaning, and uh, Jan, I think it's uh, it's a he, um, but it might not be, um, talking about the experience of meaning and doing it in terms of Gestalt psychology, and then explicitly in a chapter relating Gestalt psychology uh, to the Platonic theory of the forms, and then wondering why th those two things didn't actually talk to each other very much when they clearly should have talked to each other a lot. There's a few things in Wertheimer, but you have this thing, and Gestalt psychology plays a big role in all the work I do on insight. Uh, Gestalt psychology is uh, having something of a comeback also through 4E Cog Psi. Um, and uh, of course, and then all the work that's coming out around the hemispheres, for, for example, the popularity, deservedly so, of, of Miguel Chris's work and about how the right hemisphere is. is you know, gestalt oriented um, and works in terms of this constant open exploration rather than seeking closure and, and, and definition, finite completeness, like the left hemisphere does in its step-by-step -step processing. Um, so there's a lot, and, and that, that was not an exhaustive thing. What, what I mean is there's this, there's this turn uh, to <clears throat> this whole family of related themes around the gestalt, the form, um, you know, uh, the right hemispheric, um, the experience of meaning. So I, I, I just wanted to say that I, that's all just a matter of reinforcement of, of Johannes's point. I think there is a return now. I don't know about the issue of necessity. I want to talk more in an exploratory fashion about it. But I think that the, there's clear evidence for this as a phenomenon. 
uh, right now. And so I think it's a very good question to ask, why now? Um, and is it purely contingent or is there a necessary thing going on here? So, um, Daniel, yeah. why now? <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yeah. for me, uh, I think what uh, part of it is, this is almost a paradox <laughs> because of the, uh, 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 but it's not, it's just because we're, we're doing a, 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 an equivocation in terms of the sounds of words. But I think the collapse of the attempt to have formal systems that encompass all of reality has actually led to return to a question of the form. What I mean by that is we thought we knew what we meant by form in terms of formalism yeah. and formal systems, and those have collapsed, yeah. and therefore our attempts, our presuppositions are like, I'm losing this almost as a Collingwood does, you know, there are metaphysical presuppositions about what constitutes intelligibility have come into question. And we're seeking alternative understanding of what we were pointing to with formalism, but which formalism ultimately failed to capture or disclose. Hmm. That would be my initial proposal. So very briefly, so the, the let's say the demise of the, the a priori uh, encyclopedia as a collection of rules. Um, mm -hmm. I'm looking at my Hegel at the moment. Um, yes. and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and maybe also, uh, yeah, so just to mention this very briefly, what, what perhaps this, this, this means also that there were these attempts also very, you know, very specifically in, in Hegel to have a, a perfectly formalized uh, system. Mm -hmm. Um, which, which is uh, on the one hand was necessary because we, we do need some sort of justification of categories. Um, but at the same time, and of course it's grounded in Hegel in, in a metaphysics, uh, but not in one that is perhaps as, I don't know, alive or so than uh, perhaps a Plato's was or so. Mm. I'm, I wonder, but yeah, just a brief remark. Daniel, did you? I would, uh, what I have in, 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 in the back of my head, and maybe Johannes correct me if this is wrong. Um, I, I, I heard a talk by Ryosuke Ohashi, who is like in the current generation of Japanese philosophy. And he, he's very interested in, in, Hegel, uh, in, in Schelling. So there's a talk about Schelling and how Schelling abandoned the idea of a system kind of like fell into despair as a result and could only talk about it in a negative sense as the ungrund, the non-ground, um, which he then tried. So, so this is kind of like, which also then led to the schism between Hegel and, and Schelling, I believe. Um, and Oha, she talks about this, there is this similarity between the ungrund to the Mahayana conception of Shunyata, this inexhaustibleness, that we that this kind of like this contingency which we can find everywhere but which is can not be brought into a formalized system because we'll always break it open um and i guess that maybe the return of the forms just points to this realization that we are having that we cannot formalize everything and put it into a system into kind of like circles that are always enclosed but there's this more dimension which which sometimes just breaks open and if we if we cannot in practices also i think that's why john's work is so important if we can't um kind of like come into conformity with this this inexhaustibility in in practices then we we will suffer this kind of like meaning crisis because like um we, we cannot we cannot we cannot this is kind of like what heidegger was trying it's also kind of like uh, was wrestling with right that by trying to formalize everything and put everything into this kind of like in a huge in framing um that just that the, the sen sense is evading and then we, we yeah we fall into this what we call sense crisis or meaning crisis right um, and I think I think Schelling 
at least Oha, she says, is right. Schelling was kind of like um, realizing this, but couldn't bring it into, right? Mm. He, 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 he couldn't um, make, he could only think of it negatively, which is also right. Nietzsche had this, right? The, the, the abyss is, is only realized negatively. Um, and then Heidegger, the, the off ground, the up ground, that is also coming back, and he's also wrestling with this. But it can be right; it can be the dimension real, where we really can realize the essence of human freedom if we if we know how to comport ourselves in the proper way to it. And I think we need practices for this um, very very deeply. I'd like to offer one more observation, picking up on something Daniel said about how we like, and this is part of what Schelling discovered. You always break through. Um, you always break through. So we, we had a model and, and you know, it, it, there's a lot, Hegel had a lot to do with it, but there's also independent lines coming through, uh, you know, the scientific tradition too. Uh, reason is systematization, formalization and systematization. And then you said something in part, Daniel, which is that reason, and this is something that is emphasized by D.C. Schindler, um, and you can see that this is what Kierkegaard is pointing to uh, within uh, Hegel, and uh, and then Kierkegaard says that's what Christ is also pointing to with with, with to, towards any law or moral system. This is a very good book, by the way, by Howland, Kierkegaard and Socrates, uh, really good book. Um, the point is um, that reason reason must in reason is inherently i would say self-transcending because it's inherently self-correcting um and there's a and there's a paradox in self-transcendence because you become other than yourself in order to become yourself but be become more of what you were which is all and you know plato tries to get this with things like recollection uh, right and the theory of recollection and things like that um and you know this ties up with uh, L.A. Paul's work and Agnes Callard's work about aspiration. Reason is inherently aspirational. And I think what we're discuss what's coming back to the fore is instead of the cognitive closure of the system, we're pointing to the openness, right, of self-transcendence, the field of transcendence, right, as opposed to the, the closure of the system is coming to the fore as a feature of reason that we need to emphasize again. And I think the forms uh, do exactly that. The forms try to emphasize um, are, this sounds like a paradox and there's, and I think it's bound up with the paradox of self-transcendence within rationality, which is, right, we, we have an intimate relationship with transcendence um, in, in, in reason. And this is very much what comes through. Um, Highland talks about this in his book on Plato, uh, finitude and transcendence, and that Plato's always putting those two together, and that's why we're always always lovers of wisdom and never never possessors of it. Um, and so, I mean, like even think about this, like 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 let's go back to formal systems, and this is like Jerry Fodor, computational theory of mind, which is really the formal systems model of cognition come to fruition. You know, and one things I like about Fodor is he's you know he's a He's a, he's a creator and arch defender of the computational theory, and he's also one of its most severest critics, which me, me, makes me really, although I reject a lot of his positive theses now, I just, I just admire that self-criticism, that self-correction. Um, and he points, he, he came up with an argument that there can't be anything like Piagetian development, because his argument was, well, cognition is computation, and computation is ultimately bound by a logic, and qualitative development, like we see in children, would mean a change in competence, not just a change in performance. And that computationally would mean moving from a weaker log logic to a stronger logic, like going from propositional logic uh, to predicate logic or predicate logic to modal logic. And then he rightly points out, there's nothing you can do within propositional logic that will get you to predicate logic. You can run infinite manipulations and you'll never get, right? You can never you can never compute your way from a weaker logic to a stronger logic because you have to step outside and do axiom introduction etc that's the self transcendence now he concluded therefore that there because cognition is computation there could that development doesn't actually occur uh, but then you can just turn it into a grand modus ponens 
take it as an established fact that human beings are self-correcting, self-transcending, they go through qualitative development, and then you get the idea that there's something intrinsic uh, to our development, our, 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 our rational development, uh, that isn't cap can't be captured by any, uh, any finite logic. Uh, we have something that's translogical, just in that fashion. I don't mean it's just translogical, by the way. I'm just using that as an example of what I'm talking about. And more and more what people so look, an obvious answer i mean Fodor touches on it without realizing its depth is he says oh well then the trans the machine that makes you do the transition is biological it's purely biological and not cognitive so he invokes a cartesian distinction but the point is what's happening in 40 cog sci is the idea that the body this is marlo ponti's idea that the body embodiment is in, is inherently an act of self-transcendence because the body has a dehiscence i right uh I indwell my body, but my body indwells the world. My body is inherently ecstatic, but it's also mo my, my most intimate way I am myself. And the body is therefore that which grounds the self-transcendence capacity of, of, uh, of reason. And I think that's deeply right. And all of this doesn't sit well with right the, the, the Cartesian formal you know, purely mental models of intelligibility. They're all being called seriously into question. And I think that self transcend that developmental self-transcendence within rationality is coming to the fore and a lot of people are tasting it. And I think that's what a lot of these practices are focusing on, Daniel. They're trying, they're not putting in, right? and some people find this frustrating. They're not trying to come to cognitive conclusion. They're trying to continually open a field of self-transcendence. Um, now I have I have a question, right? I, I right we talked about this last time, and Tanabe, right? He, he was he was he was critical about reason, yeah. Because reason, right? I think your point is also right. Reason can also bullshit itself. Yep, very much. Yep, there's yep. a there's a very dark, there's a dark side to reason. Yes. Um, which which I think Tanabe experienced in his own life right because he, yeah. he really fell into the kind of like militaristic um but just the propaganda that was going around at the time so he was yeah. right we, we talked about this right we were emphasizing faith um so, so what's the role of faith maybe yeah in, in this kind of like pair right with reason and faith and i was thinking about this and that we maybe need a dialect of reason and faith so they kind of like are, are mutually shaping kind of like our our self transcendence so to mm -hmm. say this mm -hmm. this kind of like how we we realize reality in this this is right this openness that we are always facing because right this 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 openness right this is even the, the experience I have in dialogos or when we practice, right? When we practice dialectic or so um, with others. Um, one of my friends who's also like with, with Johannes in one of the courses, um, right? He also said this kind of like we, we, we first need a kind of like friendship yeah. or trust. We need to have faith in each other. Otherwise, yeah. this whole yeah. practice doesn't, isn't so powerful in, in, overall and this is this a whole element right that when that we need a sangha and we need communities of practice which are really um deeply also faithful yeah. in yeah. each other right um and so, so that's something that i also would like to put on the table so <laughs> well i th i mean i think what dc schindler is especially in the catholicity of reason which is the book i'm reading after love in the postmodern predicament um, and, and this book by Howland, right, is that the leap of reason and the leap of faith are not opposites to each other. Um, they interpenetrate and support each other. Um, and it's something like, right, um, the relationship I have to the divine double. I, there, there's the, the tariki, the other power, right, that's other than me, but affords me becoming more of me 
or and for Kierkegaard, that's like the Christ figure, right? Right. Uh, you know, when St. Paul says this, it's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me, that sort of that, that, but the fact, but that, that we're actually tutored in that, in our ability to internalize other people, like, like uh, I can other myself in self trans. This is Vygotsky's argument only because I have internal. I've indwelt you and internalized you, and you've allowed me, and and I've allowed you to do the same with me. And that's that faithfulness, that mutual indwelling. Uh, if we if we don't set up the mutual indwelling, then we 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 like. This is I I, I guess I don't know if this is answering the question. I'm trying my best, Daniel. But I think when we come to our relationship to the other, the other in the other, and the other in me, if, that is at the core of the paradox of self-transcendence, the line between the leap of reason and the leap of faith for me completely blurs. Like I can't, I can no longer say it, it's it's one rather than the other. Um, um, and and, and you, you you catch that right, like in the moment of insight. Is that a leap of faith or a leap of reason? Well, uh, right. I, I can't. I can't. I can't cleanly. I can't cleanly cleave the rational off from the faithful in that. Um, so, I mean, that's what, and and that's that. That's why I've been so attracted to um, th this particular topic. Chris, Master Pietro, and I are going to do a video series on Socrates and Kierkegaard, really exploring this in depth. So your question, I think, is very pertinent. Um, and the fact that, uh, here's, what, here's what I'll propose, and then I want to hear what Johannes has to say. I think the return to form and then the rapprochement between the leap of faith and the leap of reason, I think those are two sides of the same phenomena. I think they're two sides of the same thing that are happening um, right now. One question, perhaps. Why, though, it all was there this drive to have a purely computational, calculative grounding or foundation for world access? Because if I were a bit nasty, I could say what, you know, but this maybe is completely off, but that, that what. What we call so benignly philosophy, or uh, in, in opposition to sophistry, is is not a battle of arguments or so, but is uh, a battle between. And philosophy itself becomes necessary because the sophists all of, come up as what as as a let's say a, a, a movement that destroys access, genuine access to phenomena. Mm -hmm. So the, the salvation or, well, that's maybe saying too much, the safeguarding, the saving of phenomena, sotsein phenomena, I think is the Greek, is yeah. what the, the so-called uh, pre-Socratic, say the early Greek thinkers, um, are, are trying to articulate um, and therefore also ground the human being through that in the world. Um be able to, in you know, the very broad strokes again, be able to articulate being and becoming and how they interrelate, etc. So with, um, and of course, then also then we get with Aristotle, we get to causality and uh, indebtedness, etc. with the so-called four causes we touched on last time as well. But with the sophist, something is, um, something more fundamental is attacked which is precisely that genuine access where the world discloses itself to us and we're not purely trying to control or manipulate it um so if my question is then was this perhaps this attempt to have a purely calculative computational access to the world not nefarious but one that you know almost instinctively there was an understanding that we were lacking a, a Grunderfahrung, um, the science. So this is a German word. Um, Grunderfahrung would mean something like an experience of ground, but at the same time would mean something like a foundational 
fundamental experience that also at the same time grounds and founds something so that uh, you can read all which is a, let's say an ontological experience about what it means to be human right not just an ontic experience to speak in that language of Husserl and Heidegger but one where our being human um, is is really shining forth and then that was attempt, so that there was an attempt to corroborate an access to the world um, and access to the other and to ourselves, etc. Through this, but at the same time that this was a, is is has now run its course, um, and ne therefore necessitates something else. Where at the same time, <clears throat> the danger that I see, and this is something I think we touched on last time that Daniel and I have discussed before, the the danger that there could be is that we do realize that there's something that's lacking. So, so we go into an a priori mode where we just draw up all the necessary conditions and then have a, you know, a, 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 almost a perfect map or so. And we're back with the formalized uh, system uh, that doesn't let something arise. While the need for that fundamental experience is there um, and but cannot be, say, optimized for. So this was three different topics now in the end, but um, I, hope it, <laughs> I hope it says something. But, but those were good. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't know if this is the correct framing, but I, I heard the first question historical. Yeah. Like why, yeah. why, why the turn? Uh, why the turn? A and... I, th I think it's precisely, uh, you know, the, the, the reasons I articulate in more in depth in the series and in some more recent, I think, you know, it's the rise, it's the rise of nominalism um, and, and nominalism arises because, and this is, this is something Sandy points out that Plato's wrestling with in the Parmenides, which is the dialogue, which is most concerned with how not to think about the forms, right? If you want to put it that way. Um, and, and Sandy is trying to point out that the, the forms are all, the, 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 the Parmenides, he argues, uh, dialogue is actually pedagogical. It's, 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 it's an ascesis. It's a spiritual exercise to trying to get you out of thinking of the thing, out of thinking of the forms as things, right? And, 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 and that's hard to do. Whereas nominalism represents, um, if I can put it this way, it, it's tendacious, right? Uh, a capitulation to the intuition that things are the most real, um, sort of concrete individual things. Um, and so nominalism is, 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 is an abandonment. And then what happens is you get like chaos and what's paradox, like what will what sound initially sort of uh, not paradoxical, but confusing is it's actually a, 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 a brief reburst of Neoplatonism in Copernicus and in Kepler, right? And in Galileo, by the way, that actually says, oh, but wait, there is a language that is not the language just of thought, but is the language of the universe. And that's Galileo, by the way, and that's math. And so math yep. is the attempt to bring back what was yep. being lost of Plato in, like, in the rise of nominalism. But what was, what was, what was forgotten, I would po uh, pose to you, is what one of the things Plato tried to use math to do, and you see this in the dialogues, and it's referred to in Parmenides, is math is ultimately designed to try and get you to, to see the forms in a non-thingy fashion. And that was not remembered in, that, in the scientific re reuse, yep. Yep. right? Yep. And so what you get is you get math applied to and quantized things. Hmm. And so there's, there's simultaneously a remembrance and a forgetfulness there. Yep. And so, yep. right, and that really makes that attractive to people because it seems like the way out of nominalism but it also causes the forgetfulness of what was i would argue was what was core in what plato was trying to teach us um and so we lose the capacity if what we've been i, I would argue for that sense of contact with reality and we replace it with mathematical certainty that's what's mm -hmm. going to Assage all of our epistemic and existential anxieties, um, and so I think that that is deeply, deeply pervasive. Um, um, in I mean, I I take it that's part of what Heidegger meant, right? 
and it's 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 surprise. I mean, Heidegger was you know the really pointed out how mathematics plays such a central role in science that we have forgotten that the science before Copernicus and Galileo and Kepler was not mathematical at all. And that, that, that strikes many modern years as almost an oxymoron, right? But how, how can you do science without math? Uh, and so I think what we're getting is, is we're getting a shadow of, if I can use these things together, a shadow of platonic faith in the Cartesian quest for certainty. Yeah. That's what I would propose as a historical answer uh, to that. And that means that, that, that given, you know, Godel and other things, we can't actually get what we want, um, but we're, we're not going to get it if we still cling to um, the, the the underside of nominalism that runs through the or the yeah. the scientific worldview. At least that's what I would propose. Does that does that, yeah. does that feel like it, it goes some way towards addressing at least your first point? Yeah, yeah, and and uh, well, we you know we could. This is a, maybe for for another time because that that's very important. Also, and I would have to read up on it. There's a very good book by I think uh, I think the first name is Jacob. The last name definitely is Klein. On the difference between uh, ancient Greek mathematics and modern mathematics, yes, and yes. how it was differently grounded, really, um, yeah. and um, that there is a certain uh, difficult word we have to be careful because not meant in a political sense, but a certain uprootedness um, of modern mathematics. Um, yes. But at the same time, the way you just described it, I think to a certain degree um, supported the, you know this this suspicion that. Um, there is an attempt to secure uh, access to the world here yes, and, and to yes. make it, you know, and not just purely to make it controllable, but, um, but, but to really to guarantee in this moment of awakening subjectivity, which comes with its own bag, baggage, right, of, of severe yeah, yeah. doubt. And is, is God a demon? You know, is anything, is anything real, you know, yeah. um, where we are now, is this all a simulation? So we can see all of this uh, already there. I mean, when you read the meditations, it's a wild text um, yeah. where he's going with uh, what God could be. Um, and, and, and also this is something maybe that we should point out that we, that subjectivity itself is, is modern, is not something that is there in in the greeks there is a uh, a sense of ego but there is no real subject very often and this is the case today still in 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 um in in in, in the italian vernacular you don't really need to say i you know it's just it's in the verb it's in the ending of the word um and very often the language also doesn't really need nouns you can have entire Sentences constructed purely with uh, gerundifs or participle constructions, etc. Especially in the some of the fragments that we have from Heraclitus, still, as it's purely the we would almost say process or the event that's being uh, described. Um, and um, at the same, just to come back, we briefly made to Hegel. Hegel uh, says somewhere that beim Denken muss einem hören und sehen vergehen. So when you start thinking properly. And you have to lose your your sight and your hearing. Um, so to to reach that level of abstraction, that's exactly what for Hegel, what higher mathematics is necessary for. So this is not to demonize uh, math or so, um, but the question is whether once it's completely unfounded, it turns um, it turns itself you know turns into too abstract, and it doesn't come back anymore to Say to a, a grounding in in nature or something of 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 of, of affinitude or so, where it's, it it has certain limitations again that it experiences or so. That 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 would be my sort of point of critique or so. There, Daniel, there's a talk by D.C. Schindler where he talks about this encounter of God, world, and man in techne in in kind of like work. And he, he brings up in the talk, he brings up the, the example of, of The Office, right? That TV show from America. Um, maybe you know. Yeah, that's, a, that's great. <laughs> it's a very, <laughs> nope. very human show. 
because yeah. because the, the the point he makes is right they calculate all the time and they do things with paper but you never see paper in the whole show it's like <laughs> it's like we, we we do all sorts of things with with but we we completely alienated from from what is actually right where this this nexus point where we can then actually encounter right god world and also come to ourselves so to say in let's say the the object or the work of art that we we are um working on and that's that's kind of like this weird conundrum that we find ourselves in when everything gets too abstract right so i think the point is right that math is okay right but if it's completely if we just calculate everything um, without ever seeing the products that we're kind of like that we are working towards, then there's something going wrong in this sense. Um, and then, then, right, you said Grunderfahrung des Seins, then, then being just is, is absent because we, we kind of like we're just stuck in, in, in it's refusing itself, right? This is the point that the Chinaro always makes. But we are sense it kind of like meaning crisis is is the refusal of being, but it can this can also be a point of freedom because that's at least where we can start, that we are kind of like devoid of sense that can help us then to kind of like move forward in this and, and penetrate this point deeper. And that we maybe then find something there which is which is more. And, and I am at least to, to speak of my example. I'm, I'm very um, like, like for me, this meaning crisis is very, <laughs> is, is a very uh, strong experience. So that I have to keep kind of like pursuing this and trying to to find this more dimension and to to hold myself in it, such that I can can have experiences of of meaning and sense. Um, Maybe to the historical dimension, right? Um, the, right. Nishitani makes this point. He's kind of like getting also at the uh, right with time. We kind of like John, you you point this out in your meaning crisis series in one of the earlier episodes. Kind of like the Hebrews introduced this radical idea that we are now embedded in a history, right? And um, Nishitani is making the same point, right? So we kind of like everything is structured like a drama then it has a climax. And then we have kind of like the eschaton that the end somewhere. There. And what Nishitani makes this point, what this, when, what we see now, when, when we see now in our time where this has been um, kind of like deconstructed by, by the scientific revolution. And now we're kind of like, we, we are still in this, in this framework. But we we can't we can't make sense of time anymore because kind of like a Judeo Christianity has kind of like put everything into this into this drama of the revelation and of divine providence, and now every 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 moment of time is kind of like drawn or sucked in into this into this revelation, and he contrasts this with Buddhism where he says like all moments of time have a kind of solemnity to them that we can realize and, and not just, let's say, Christmas or, or Easter, um, but all, all moments in time kind of like can offer us this, this inexhaustibility um, if we realize it. Um, I think two themes came up that might also uh, help unpack the, uh, the historical aspect. Um, I do want to remember that Johannes had two other points, and so maybe he could review them again for us. And we do want to perhaps, maybe next time, the one, we'll talk about the one. One is, another reason why computation, and this is a, a very much a Heideggerian argument, one of the reasons why computation is so powerful is because it gets embedded in a technology in which abstract math has causal power. That's what a computer as a machine is. A computer is a machine that has been built so that the abstract order of logic and right and the concrete order 
of causal patterns have been made rendered isomorphic and kept isomorphic to each other. So the abstract becomes at least the powerful. Now that's not the same thing as the intimate, but that 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 is initially so promising to people because it looks like, oh, finally we can connect the abstract where we have certainty to the causes where we have power. So we can have certainty in our power. And this is what computationalism offers. And 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 and, and not and not impotently, I'm not saying it's ultimately correct in claiming this, but look, I mean, everything we're doing right now is being empowered by computation, right? Yeah. By technical computation. And I think that is also part of the attraction of this approach, because the idea that we can, we can put, I, I think this is ultimately wrong, but it looks like we can put reasons and causes together. And, and, the, and the, you know, and, and Plato famously said, you know, the, they're like, how do we get them together? And computation says, here's how, and look, uh, I can prove it to you because you're using me every single minute of the day, right? There's the, there's the, you know, the end framing of technology. It's all around us. So not only is there all these philosophical arguments, there's the actual instantiation of computational power yep. in, in, in every moment of your life as an ongoing argument that this is the way in which we get to reality. And I think that that is also so. I I, I think the computational technology is perhaps in many ways the most powerful reason why it's so compelling uh, to people uh, today. And I and I think I think I, I think sorry. I, I, this I don't want this to sound self so self promotional. This is why I think 4E cognitive science is so important because it is right a scientific endeavor to show that the computational account of cognition, at least 4E cognitive science, right, is inadequate, I inadequate. And to actually point to the possibility of other kinds of techne, other kinds of ways of working in the world in which the abstract can become causal. That's why I'm so interested in eidetic eduction and psychotechnologies because I want to under I want to put the forms back into work, into action, into something that people can taste and, and in which they can find themselves. Uh, and that's what happens in these practices. Um, because for me, that's an alternative proposal for how the abstractness of the forms can be present in the causal guts of your life. And embodiment, again, is where those two come together. This is, this is so central for Marleau-Ponty, right? Um, once you realize how embodied cognition has to be, th then the, the attempt to... I, I don't know what... I, I, I think I'm talking too much. But what I'm saying is, like, the, like we have to offer an alternative in practice mm -hmm. to computation's answer of how you get the abstract yeah. and yeah. The, the reasons and causes together. We have to offer an alternative. You're, you're the guest here, just like Daniel, so everyone can talk as long as they need to. Um, very briefly, maybe on Heidegger and then something else. Heidegger says... He's, uh, this is a quote from him, I'm not against technology. And he says this to Richard Wisser, who was a filmmaker. Um, and he says, I want to understand it in its reason, in its essence, or in its, um, say, realm. And th there it is a realm, right? It, it, it opens up, it spans open a, a certain dimension or, or area in which it is seemingly exclusive and it, it, it it's but it's it would be one dimensional to assume ourselves as purely and only it inhibiting that world or that dimension and the response that he gives is the gefiat this the, the fourfold usually in english the four regions of mortals earth divinities and sky which is not a utopia that will come after the dystopia of techniques or technology. It's not something that even runs parallel to it, but it's intertwined with it. 
In fact, Heidegger can see Gestell because there are shifts within it where it is fracturing and not absolutely powerful. And this is where the fourfold shows itself. So it's a question of, um, of bringing the multidimensionality of our being to the fore rather than being, you know, because this, we talked about this once, John, years ago, when you said it's not nostalgia and it's not utopia. Remember that one? Um, and this is exactly where we are now too, where we, when we, when we just, when we address this, and this is by the way, because you were mentioning practice is the other point I wanted to make practice is in listening. Now there will be that we're recording this and this will go up on YouTube and maybe a few other channels and people will listen to this. When someone listens to this, take the time and really listen. So don't think we're saying, oh, but mathematics is bad and it has to go out the window. Blah, blah, blah. No, because you, we couldn't orient ourselves or we have, how do we find any orientation uh, without having a, so, some basic coordinates um, that are, you know, if you like, pre-theoretically already mathematical or geometric by which we can find uh, a path in the world even if it's a completely untrodden path in the, in, in, in the wild. Um, there, is a, there must be regularity to the world uh, because without it, you, you end up like Hume. Um, or, and, and also, so, so, when in, so the practice here is to, to listen to the other possibilities that are also there, which do not cancel out, so they're not mutually exclusive. But this is an attempt of bringing together, and this now ties this back to the brief mentioned uh, mention I make made. Sorry, I made of Heraclitus before, where we I think when we think of harmony, then we think of uh, you know everything's nice and cuddly, etc. But there can be a harmony which is full of tension, um, but is it's a healthy tension. Uh, the my example often is the orchestra. There's a massive amount of tension just in the instruments. Um, but it's, you know, take out the tension from the violin and this, this you cannot play. It, it, it's, it goes. So we, that kind of, so we're not, I think, at least I wouldn't say that this can all be perfectly integrated into one wonderful whole. Um, but no, but this is a continuous. Um, a task where we can find momentary balances and equilibria uh, only to begin again and again in a very artistic, poetic way of, of allowing ourselves to ground ourselves in different ways that, that we maybe we have allowed ourselves in the past centuries or so. That's how I would put it for now. That was beautiful. That was really well put. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, I certainly don't want to say math is bad or uh, <laughs> that technology is bad, uh, uh, since that would be a performative contradiction for me in a lot of ways. Uh, the way you put it, I think, was great. I, I'm thinking of Rusin's book in Bearing Witness to Epiphany, where he talks about the three, the three dimensions, but you could even use the phenomenological notion of moments of intelligibility, the musicality of intelligibility. Um, there is the melody, which is like the through line, and then there's the harmony in that the, the, the various through the, the through lines of various objects somehow one with each other, like in an orchestra. But then there's all, but there's, there's also this, there's there's the there's the grounding of continuity, which mm -hmm. is the rhythm, which is the repetition, the invariant, right? And science, for me, picks up on the rhythms of reality, if I can put it that way, and and, and that is absolutely central to intelligibility. But science, science isn't as good at, as the harmonies, and it's not really set up for the melodies. Um, and uh, so I certainly don't want to exclude rhythm from the musicality of intelligibility. I just want to, like, I want, I want to do what Johannes is saying. So I'm just, I'm just saying I'm in, in agreement with him. I want to open up the multidimensionality of intelligibility uh, as much as possible. Um, this is almost like a, Pythagorean thing. I want. I want to. I want to be able to fully hear as much as possible the incompletable uh, music of uh, of being right and right and so. Um, I, 
I think I don't I don't think we should broach it here because we're we're getting close to the end of time, uh, our time. Uh, but for me, when we start talking about how this all hangs together, that is the better way to approach what we're gonna if we're gonna talk about it. The one, rather than thinking of the one as a system or a shape, right? Um, thinking about it this way, um, I think is a, a much better way to try and approach it because we can only ever approach it. We can never reach it. Um, I, I was, the one always makes me think of Browning's line, right? A man's reach should exceed his grasp or what is a heaven for? If you can grasp the one, it was no kind of one, right? Um, so um, yeah, I, 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 I totally agree with you. And I just wanted to reinforce what you were saying, Johannes. And I thought Rusin is particularly helpful because we, we can expand right the metaphor of uh, the musicality of intelligibility and we can talk about the melody the harmony and the rhythm um and that different um domains of intelligibility uh are appropriate for the different dimensions but that ultimately in in philosophy i mean this is dc schindler reason is ultimately oriented to the whole reason qua reason in the platonic sense wants to talk about right the the whole more like the gestalt rather than the complete, right? But the whole of the rhythm, the harmony, and the melody of uh, of reality. And so, um, I think that's. I mean, that's uh, that's kind of again. This circles back. Why now? We're really struggling. We can't like. I, I like. I reject all proposals that say, "Well, let's just get, undermine science or throw science away." And it's like. And then, and then these people lead lives of ongoing performative contradiction as they use their smartphones and their computers and get in their cars and, and blah, 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 blah. It's like, come on, right? You don't, like, you're just, you're, just, you're, 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 you're bullshitting, right? Yeah. And that's um, actually, that's not, they're not free. I mean, something that was mentioned briefly before uh, by both of you was the question of human freedom. Yeah. Um, and, and that to me is the, one of the most important questions. It's, it's human memory and human freedom yes. these two uh really crucial and and by the way because you, so you call it what a performative contradiction uh that there's a lot of performance uh a lot of performativity going around and that, that but that in itself i mean is, is is it's ironic but it's i think also ultimately uh an unfree stance to take yes because yes. you're not you're not you because you it's you haven't integrated um your actions into your so-called theory um and so there's a complete um breakdown between um how you what you say and how what you do and i think that that is in itself you know, and you in a weird way you're, you're you're enslaving yourself to what you oppose also that could, that could also always happen with that right um yeah yeah so And that, and that, and that again is Kierkegaard's deepest point of critique against Hegel, right? Uh, so is that right? This, that's what he meant by Hegel wrote a system and then sat down beside it, like uh, that he saw all the people, all the Hegelians espousing all this stuff and then living lives of ongoing performative contradiction. Um, and so he wanted to get back to, like, he thought Socrates was a figure in which uh, there was no performative contradiction, and then he wanted to put that. Into conversation with the figure of Christ, um, yeah, I, I, I think that's that's right. Um, and so for me, that also is part of what's happened in in, in, in the quest for formalization. Um, like, let me, uh, Johannes, and uh, I think maybe all three of us, but I know Johannes talked about it in his uh, biography, and I've talked about it in mine. Like the fact that. Um, you can be, and the Kierkegaard was was making this criticism back in his day that you can be a professional philosopher and it has nothing to do with how you live your life or cultivate your character or love yeah. wisdom. It's just a bizarre place that we have gotten to. And if it, and, and again, I'm not dissing people who are academic philosophers. I have great colleagues and I value them, and I don't want to be disloyal to them. But there's something there's something profound missing. There's a there's a functional hole. Uh, within <laughs> philosophy, if yeah. if if it's like, why would you care about something that ultimately makes no impact on your life or your character? That's that, that's Kierkegaard's question, um, and 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 is this ultimately a grand distraction rather than some disclosure of being? Um, so I would add, yeah, to and I think this reinforces 
Johannes's point that there's a kind of enslavement with people who want to say, let's just give it up, blah, blah, blah. blah. Um, and you get that in various kinds of fundamentalisms, right? Um, and, 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 and then on the other side, a kind of distract, a self-distracting scientism that doesn't want to s- stop and say, yes, but am I living this in a profound way, in a Kierkegaardian sense? And I think those two play off against each other. Other people have noted this. Right, that the new atheists and the fundamentalists need each other. They rely on each other uh, for existence. And um, oh yeah, so I, of I, course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I just wanted to broaden the scope of the enslavement, if I could put it that way, uh, Johannes. That's what I, I wanted to to say. I want to. I mean, I, I want to make space for 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 Daniel though. He hasn't had a chance to speak in a bit. Uh, that that was great, John. This is almost perfect as a as a kind of like close close up for this whole conversation, I believe. <laughs> um, do I have anything I want to add? Uh, no, just read that the, the the philosophers that I was so attracted to, namely the Kyoto School, are tr- trying just that. Right, Nishitani thought that the mutual opposition between uh, technology or technicized science and religion was kind of like driving the, the nihilism of our time because they they again what you just say right the, the new the new atheists need the, the fundamentalists and they kind of like in this opposition where again i when i watch those debates nothing fruitful comes out of them usually they are they're just enhancing our, 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 our the sense of the crisis, and it's just perpetuated, but without any any genuine possibility of reconciliation, I guess. And there I find your approach, right? Let's say with the four ways of knowing, for example, where we can have where we have space for, let's say, propositional knowledge or mathematical knowledge. But we also have a, a place for, let's say, religious knowledge and participatory knowing. Um, I find that, and, and again, a system that is always open, right? We can never we can never grasp the one because it's not a thing. Um, we can only, so to say, transcend towards it, aspire towards it, and we can do that until until the day we die. Um, and that's, I think, a much better um, outlook than the other outlooks that we have maybe in our time. Yeah, there's a view in um, Orthodox Christianity, especially going back to Gregory of Nyssa, of epictasis, where um, the, like, in paradise with God, you're not coming to sort of rest in the sense of, um, like, sleep and being sedentary. Actually, you're, you're, you're resting in uh, a groove, if I can put it this way, um, of of ongoing self-transcendence. And God is the always supporting field and affordance of that continual self-transcendence. Um, and that's what the theosis means. That's what the divinization means, is that we're, we, we're vectored in God in terms of a field that constantly supports the vector, if I can use that mathematical language. Um, and um, so, yeah, uh, I, 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 I've always been deeply impressed by um, the interpretation of science as a profound recognition of the scientific method that emer- the scientific methods, by the way, there isn't one method, there's a family of methods. The scientific methods, one of the things they share in the scientific revolution is a deep understanding of our proclivity for self-deception and that we can get, engage with others and with the world uh, and that's what, what the math was originally supposed to afford. One of the reasons for the math is that you and I could talk the same language so that you could correct me and I could correct you, right? That what you see is this terrific understanding of the capacity for self-deception and that the scientific methods are, 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 all, a pro- are all processes of self-correction rather than processes of final pronouncement on reality. And, 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 and like there, so there was a lot more... I mean, I, I want to be. I mean, I still meet a lot of scientists who have that epistemic humility, uh, at, 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 like that that Socratic humility at the core of their practice. But I think the, when that gets, when the propositions and pronouncements, sorry, when the propositions of science are turned into pronouncements that are separated 
from the existential task of overcoming self-deception, I think we lose the heart of science. And I think we lose the heart of how science can connect to things like religion and faith. Because one way of understanding religion is it emphasizes the self-correction within the leap of faith that is not separable from, but not reducible to the self-correction within the leap of reason. And again, and I, I, one of the, like, let me give you an example of how this is ignored. I think what happens on both sides, don't forget, I grew up in a fundamentalist family, right? Both sides is the fundamentalists compare the worst science to the best religion. And the fundamentalists often compare the worst religion to the best science. And, and, and for, me, for me, Daniel, that's one of the reasons why these debates are absolutely sterile and useless, right? Because there, there, is no, there is no way in which they can mutually respect each other's domain. And again, um, I, I think that we could, if we looked back to the existential virtues required to do science, to really love the truth, and to find it good and beautiful, then we could enter into discussions between science and religion that are not sterile. At least that's what I'm proposing. And that's what I try to disclose in both my theoretical work and in my practices. Yeah, very good. I think that's um, probably one of the major main tasks of this century, if it's not supposed to go. <laughs> into the abyss completely um and uh um so i think this was a very good um point where we could end it for now but i also think that in the next dialogue what's been spitting is the one so we shall turn to it uh without reifying it of course no reification of the one yeah, I mean, epictasis is kind of perpetual metanoia that is not futile. That and that that's part of the that's part of uh, I think that's what part of trying to understand Nishitani's notion, uh, right? Of uh, of sort of the the sacramental nature of each moment. Uh, we don't need just the culminating moment. Uh, um, yeah. And I think also, you know, this, this sense of oneness, and I said this to Daniel, I don't know if you remember, this was in February this year, but we had a dialogue with Sohail and Javier, um, that maybe the, I mean, maybe this is a bit mental, but that the one is, we live in a world that is unprecedented in, in it's revolutionary really in, in, in the sense of what revolution means after 1789 um, where we do have access to everything anywhere all at once um, and what we call globalization etc that that to me is a bit of a sign of an all unifying one mm. uh, which can go either way right it can be a very homogenizing destructive uh, force or it can become a very different force, um, mm -hmm. which which allows for difference, distinction, uh, and the beauty of the other, uh, without flattening everything. And I, I see that I see that connection there. That this maybe is why the one does come back. It's a bit spooky, mm -hmm. but I'll leave it at that. One. So, thank you, gentlemen, for today, and then we'll continue this very soon. I hope. Thank you, Johannes, and thank you, Daniel. Thank you, John and Johannes.